this isn't the 12th week. There was that one week where we had uh, really bad connection problems and there were multiple recordings. So this will be numbered as number 12. Um, uh, so before I get started, do you guys have any uh, any issues or concerns about the assignments? I think we've covered all the way through uh, all of the DBs and the IT for number through uh, uh, IP number five. And just again, once again, just want to reiterate for those who of you out there listening. Um, You have uh, five different choices. Um, you can do the uh, assignment as written in the syllabus. Uh, you can pick a different company to write about, uh, but using the same kind of structure. You can talk about a personal business plan or this five-year forecast of where you intend to be after graduation. Um, a, a nice way to do that would be to take whatever you wrote for yourself as your goals and objectives for taking the program and then projecting that uh, after the program, so five years into it, what does the success look like? Uh, and then you can uh, work backwards to your implementation plan uh, between now and then. It figures out how you get to those uh, uh, successful end states, which is a pretty nice exercise and strategy. This is why I recommend it. Um, or you can do the annotated bibliography, picking the 10 best resources that you found uh, during the course, and, uh, and do a um, annotated bib for the benefit of your peers, and then share those with each other to help build uh, your professional library. Um, uh, or fifth, uh, if you can use your own initiative uh, consistent with the goals of this course to uh, work on about a 10-page effort uh, that would tie together uh, either the concepts directly from the course or something that this course triggered you to investigate and that you'd like to do a paper on. Uh, you guys have worked so hard so well throughout the course that uh, you've certainly earned the right to um, uh, use your own judgment at the doctoral level and uh, produce something that is of most value to you um, in terms of your strategy for completing this program and going on to success. That's what the whole point of this uh, course has been, is to examine different elements of strategy and the, you know, the use of it, the development of it, the implementation of it, different models for creating and applying strategy, different perspectives, along with uh, the tools uh, that are often used in the business world for company strategies. I just feel like at this point in your career uh, and in the program, you should look beyond some of those um, technical models that MBAs use, which are very kind of finance-related and traditional uh, uh, traditional MBA programs. Uh, I think we need to do more than that. You know, the Valakangas text for uh, for all its shortcomings, is at least an effort to uh, go after some of that new and unexplored territory uh, in the area of strategy formation and what what constitutes uh, success. Yeah, Robert, if um, uh, I, I think a teaching philosophy statement, if you wanted to do a ten pager on that uh, and ap applied some of the principles that we've talked about here. Um, you are more than welcome to do it. And in fact, I was planning on going through a strategy for teaching that I have used at our college tonight. And I was going to take you through uh, the way our uh, logistics department takes a look at developing a strategy for producing professional leaders for the Army and for the Department of Defense. And, uh, and maybe there will be some ideas um, that would trigger you uh, as we go through that. So, um, very timely. Uh, so those are the those are the opportunities there. Um, 
hoping we didn't lose the internet. Microphone check, testing one, two. Mic check, testing one, two. Mic check, testing one, two. Okay. It may have just been a temporary, a little temporary glitch here. Okay, hang on. Yeah. And I lost the mic. Yeah, those are yeah, those are uh, files that I'm going to use here to support different different briefings. But my, looks like I lost the mouse control. Ah, there we go. Okay, so we're still good on the audio. Sorry for that. Okay. Um, well, let me just uh, uh, a lot of the ideas that we're going to that I'm going to cover tonight are. They come back to this central idea that I've been talking about over the weeks uh, about VUCA, and that is a world that is characterized by volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, um, which is more and more the case uh, of our strategic and ta operational and tactical environment, and which causes us to continually search for new ways to uh, add value to find our unique value add um, because things can change so much we need to be able to sense and respond and not just put uh, blind faith in a single perfect strategy for all time so there is this notion we see it in Valakangas and in some of these other uh, models we've looked at um, the importance of appreciating the environment um, and that has a lot to do with how we put strategy into action. And just want to remind you this notion that comes from Caleb, the idea of asymmetric payoff, which is searching for ways in which we can create value at lowest cost and lowest risk. Um, uh, reminder, the, the Valakangas model basically says you should look for the wow factor. What is it that makes your product or service really stand out from all others or creates a new and exciting thing in the world that nobody else has. What, and that comes down to really to, in my view, a combination of differentiation and uh, delighted customers, the things that really grab their attention, what makes you stand out. And then the so what is sort of the uh, um, a deeper analytical piece which says, why should that maintain their attention? So if the wow factor is what gets their attention, the so what factor is what keeps their attention. So it's not just a flash in the pan. It's not just a shiny thing that um, uh, mesmerizes the raccoon. You know, It's something that has deep and enduring value. And then the final part of their model, of their model is the oomph, and that is, how can you leverage uh, your resources as an organization in order to achieve maximum impact? And that usually is going to mean uh, leverage and um, seizing key terrain, if you will, or finding key uh, leverage points in the environment that allow you to multiply your effort, uh, either through media or um, inter uh, information technology, digital technology, or uh, viral marketing or partnering, uh, anything that's going to allow you to uh, rem uh, dramatically scale what it is that you do. So those are the three elements of her model. And then in her case study, she's trying to find how those factors manifested across a variety of different uh, organizations. Uh, so we talked about uh, this, this little model here, the plan, prepare, execute, and assess as being the stages of um, 
developing a strategy with planning and then going into the how to implement in the prepare phase and then putting it into actual operation in the execute phase and then the learning uh, process or the learning phase, phase four, the assessment of results. And then we recognize that this is um, a linear statement of one iteration of an action research or an action learning process so in which we uh, we don't try to fool ourselves and say we can have a complete, perfect, and enduring understanding of the situation because of the VUCA, because it's so dynamic, but we can uh, learn to iterate our decisions as as one iteration in a string of strategic choices that are all aiming towards our common objective. So uh, looking to make um, add some value with each iteration and iterate towards success. Um, we've talked about some uh, critiques and comparisons of Alicangus to a couple other models we've talked about last week. Um, going back to uh, you know, like about 2005 and then 1990 or so. So today we're going to even a little bit deeper, uh, and I want to talk about um, Kenichi Omai, uh, who uh, was a nuclear engineer and then worked as a design engineer in Japan in post World War II. He was, he was born in 1943 um, and was a, a very successful strategic thinker. Uh, in Japan, and this is at a time, you know, I would say in the 70s, when um, he began to distinguish himself as a, a design thinker and strategist, uh, whereas most of the Japanese expertise seemed to be on the operational and tactical level, the implementation of, of good ideas from the outside. They were rebuilding a war-torn country, they were applying the principles of Western management under the teachings of Dr. Deming and the statistical process control, total quality management crowd, uh, and so hadn't really distinguished themselves yet as uh, strategists. They were still trying to build, the, you know, the baseline and foundations of a professional managerial class. And so Omai oh really stood out as um, uh, maybe the first uh, or most prominent of their of strategic thinkers, and uh, he was uh, he then joined McKinsey and Company, and sort of became a uh, a gateway or a conduit for what was working in the world of uh, or the region of Asia, and uh, incorporating a lot of the original cultural insights uh, about Asia uh, with respect to large organizations and competing in the global model uh, global market. And so he um, uh, was one of the, maybe the first to really articulate those uh, points of view, right? So um, uh, the uh, one of the latest books he wrote from 2005, The Next Global Stage, was uh, one of the summaries of uh, the enduring principles of maybe a 20 or 30 year uh, career in applied leadership and strategy making in Asia and the global markets. And so he summarized uh, a, a lot of his work in what is known as the three C model. And in his view, the enduring uh, focuses um, were on uh, the corporation, uh, the customer, and the competition. Which he basically framed all his uh, insights in those dimensions. Uh, I, I found some very, I'm going to draw this connection here in a minute to, uh, in the world of military strategy, we talk about um, the intelligence prep, preparation of the battlefield as a way to uh, um, set the conditions for understanding um, of what's going on before you commit to a plan. So in, in the intel prep of the battlefield, we say you've got to be able to do three things see yourself, see the terrain, and then see the enemy. And so it really struck me in this comparison that see yourself was really understood the same as 
um, understanding your corporation and that um, uh, seeing the terrain, the area that you're going to operate in, in many ways is see the customer uh, because that's the you have to account for that external factor to go where the opportunities are and you're shaped by the uh, constraints and opportunities of the marketplace. Well, the equivalent of that in the military IPB process is, um, uh, is see the terrain and then see the competition um, and in the OMI model and that equates to see the enemy pretty well in the military strategy. Uh, so it kind of struck me that there were some uh, some some deep and enduring connections that might actually speak to us uh, across the decades. As we, as on one hand, we are thinking about the groovy terms that Valak Angus, the the wow factor, to show what the oomph. Well, in more traditional uh, management, leadership, and strategy language, uh, many of those concepts are are still found. And so I am still struggling with Valak Angus as whether she's genuinely found anything new or just put some uh, modern hipster words on things, um, uh, new names for old, Dr. Deming would, would call that. Um, Deming was always pointing out that in our search for new things that many, in many cases all people are doing are slapping new, con new, new names for old concepts and declaring it new, like it's the next newest thing. And then we, like little puppies chasing our tail, we run around after that instead of concentrating on the long-term essentials, the fundamentals uh, of the business. And uh, and so that's, in some ways, the, uh, the value that I see. Uh, when we take a scholarly approach to these theories and models, is that we're not just taking the next thing or the last thing that just came off the production line, but we are concerned with, uh, the evolution and possible improvement of ideas through the years. Um, we've looked at Porter and a number of his different models, and it's fair to ask, do the Porter models, uh, like the value chain and the five forces and the diamond framework, are those all part of some larger grand theory that he's developed, or, uh, or do they replace the previous ones, or how do they fit together in some kind of integrated way, or do they? Or should they? Is there such a thing as a grand theory of um, uh, leadership management and strategy? So I don't know, but uh, the scholarly approach is concerned with the justification for adopting new ideas uh, and placing those ideas in the context of what's going on before so you get this sense of uh, sense and respond to uh, changing world dynamics. So the way we might think about that is that when the world uh, changes, that, I'm like, I, I feel a diagram coming on now. So uh, this is what happens sometimes. Oops, that's not what we want. One of the blank ones, sorry. So here's the idea that I, what I wanted to express. Um, Uh, so one way we might look at uh, a changing world dynamic is sort of a linear path through time that we start seeing patterns that look like this, right? And uh, we, we see things are going up, um, and then things are going down, and then things are going up, and then things are going down. So we might think of the world as this sort of a, if we made a simplified model, we might see it as a sine wave almost seasonal, right? and that there are different, when things are going up, you might do one thing, when things are going down, you might do another thing, and then when things are going up, so now there's a, a seasonal response 
to the oscillation of the market. Now, the way I've drawn this, you might notice that uh, the, the next guy might say, well, we had, uh, when things were the lowest, they got down this far, and then things started to improve, and now these oscillations, the highs began to be higher, and the lows also began to get lower. So if we took the average of those, we might say, in this period of time, starting right about here, something must have happened, or something might have happened, uh, in this area that maybe some new ideas about how to get out of the hole happened and that when instead of stopping here where we used to stop in the past we actually went a little bit further and then when it pulled back we didn't we didn't come all the way back down to where it went before but we were able to raise our level and it stopped here and then started going again so in this period of time in this red box we might say hey uh, this this could be an era or a new phase. Um, if that, that might be a generational change. And that in the area of the green box, we might look back as the, as the old days. Uh, and so we might, as a scholar, say, what accounts for this change in performance that went from sideways to um, a steady improvement? There's still there's still evidence of this oscillation occurring, but it's now like that thing was tilted up a little bit, and it looks like genuine progress is being made. So as a scholar, we might look back and we might say, what was it in this uh, in this area? Let's, let's try to make it this um, orange or this purple. What happened down in this area that seems to have changed? That instead of things going this way, they are now going that way. Uh, what was the addition of it? Was it something that we changed in our internal process? Was it the addition of technology? Was it a change in the larger world around us? Maybe they were doing the same things, but the world changed, and it began to reward those behaviors more than it had in the past. Uh, so we were trying to find the root cause of that source of change. And so one of the things that you get with a scholarly approach, and I've tried to talk about this, um, if we look at this uh, on a time model, and we talk about you know 2016, the Valakangas text, and then 2003, uh, we looked at that um, that particular model around 1992. We're looking at the um, Nadler and Hibino model, the breakthrough thinking. And now maybe I want to call this around uh, 1980. Uh, the Kenichi Omai 3C model. Well, these are these correspond to almost different cycles in business operations and in the theory. So each one of these guys is a theory that talks about what's the best way to proceed. And so if we are uncritical thinkers, we might say, hey, it's 2016, and we're just going to adopt Valakangas, and we're going to study what she says. Let me see if I can find this to be complete. Um, yeah, Johnson and Bates. Johnson and Bates or something like that. If we are an uncritical thinker, or maybe if we're working at the master's level, and we just say, well, we're going to concentrate on this time forward, and the Velikangas model tells us to do those three things. The, uh, the wow factor, the so what, the um, and, uh, and that's really the way of the future. Well, it's easy to get on board that bandwagon and take the most popular current idea, and off we go. Um, the idea behind our program is that we can also look back and we can we can see what were the roots of some of these ideas. How did these different theorists looking at the world in those years and trying to make sense of this complex interaction of ups and downs and cycles and, and progress and no progress.
you know, when um, was was the uh, the changes in Japanese strategy making around 1980 a function of real brilliance on their part, or was that just really uh, what you would expect that after 30 years of trying to repair the damages from World War II, that new a new generation of leaders and managers and workers were in place uh, who had been able to rebuild the world, and now what had been a sideways uh, development. Now there was real progress available because we had 30 years to rebuild the world, learn how to cooperate with each other, and uh, and all these former warring factions now began to collaborate globally and share their best practices and insights. And so now maybe the world is ready for Kenichi Omai and his three C's. So what is it, was it a concentration on the three C's that brought this about, or was that a natural response to an improvement in the human condition, the absence of these global wars of destruction. Maybe that's what accounts for this, and maybe it wasn't these management ideas at all. So we're allowed to ask those questions as scholars, and our job is to try to unpack some of this complexity uh, through time with these different theories. So in my view, the uh, those three elements that uh, Omai talks about are perfectly compatible with the ideas that Nadler and Habino and Johnson and Bates and even Valakangas talk about. You know, when you talk about the uh, wow factor in Valakangas, we're allowed to ask which of those three C's in OMI is that wow factor to be found? Is it something internal that we developed in the corporation? Or uh, was it something in the, uh, the changing nature of the uh, of the customer, did they sud were there suddenly new customers and new markets available that had needs that could be served by somebody that weren't yet uh, in place, or did that wow factor come from uh, a response to what the competition was doing and forcing us to adapt and overcome? Uh, was that the source of the wow factor? And the so what the um, the long-term value add. How do I embody that in my infrastructure in order to preserve um, those new insights? And then the um, <coughs> the leverage. How do I uh, organize my corporation and the customer to defeat the competition or um, absorb the competition in order to uh, to scale my insights uh, more broadly? So there are certainly things that Omai talks about that uh, that add value to those three factors that Valakangas talks about. So one of the things that I hope to uh, highlight with some of these um, chats and whatnot is to show that a scholarly approach uh, considers the roots of these ideas and looks for some of these deeper fundamental questions uh, that allows us to put the the modern text or the modern theories into the cut that's informed by the past and looking to see what of the past can feed forward and still might be useful. And again, these are simply starting places for the kinds of questions that we can ask. That we we ourselves can have a theory of how to integrate uh, the big integration of these past theories with the modern treatment. Uh, but again, that's just a theory. And so in my view, it's what kind of results do we get going forward that justify our proposed integration? And so uh, this kind of a program, uh, by developing critical thinking, should allow us to explore our fundamental assumptions and our um, beliefs and the degrees of confidence we can have in our conclusions based on evidence and reasoning. And yet we should also be respectful of the challenges of putting things into practice and, and learning to act on them to test our ideas in the marketplace, in the uh, on the mat, if you will. The you know, one of the main ideas behind Ultimate Fighting Championship grew out of a desire to test these different theories of martial arts and say, when you put them all in a ring, what really happens when Kung Fu meets Judo? and jiu-jitsu meets sumo, 
uh, when Muay Thai meets Western boxing. What are the consequences of, in the real world of implementing these uh, strategies and theories? And so uh, one of the beauties of this program, in my opinion, is this emphasis on the practical application uh, of these ideas. And so it's, uh, it's important that we study some of those um, models uh, that we've had in the course. Uh, but the models and theories themselves uh, only are a start point about getting results in the future and uh, learning how to uh, apply them and how to study them. And that's why I, I like to come back to this idea of the plan, prepare, execute, and assess that in a modern world that features uh, global volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity, the world of VUCA, that any and all of these theories are subject to environmental impacts, <clears throat> and that we've got to learn how to be well prepared, not only for our plan, but for the other things that may happen. And that's why I place the emphasis on preparation. And then, uh, and then on the assessment phase, where we actually study our results. Okay, so that's sort of my, that's my take on uh, these different theoretical models I've introduced and the, the purpose or utility of doctoral scholarly approaches, but then also the practical applied scholarship of testing our theories in the real world. I mean, this is not the world of um, objective science, because we're talking about so many human factors, sociology and culture. and so. Uh, we'll never be in a position where we can definitively say what the un, um, the unchanging truth is. Maybe maybe in the world of physics you can do that, and I don't even know if that's true. So we certainly have to uh, acknowledge the theory, but also respect the practice going forward. So those are those are my thoughts on that. Uh, before I get into some of the more uh, specific I ideas, um, any questions or comments on that? Hopefully you found that um, useful. Give a chance to type anything in there before we proceed on. Um, one of the uh, one of the tools that are not covered in our book. Uh, but just I just think is uh, has stood the test of time is this SIPOC model comes out of the world of systems thinking and um, Lean Six Sigma and whatnot. That uh, regardless of which of those theoreticians that we've talked about, whether it's Val Kangas and today, um, as you're searching for the so the wow factor and you're looking for the so what or how do I leverage that. Um, in the oomph factor. The SIPOC model seems to me to be a very sound way to um, develop your understanding of the details of your environment. And you could, you, this would fit right with what Kenichi Omai was saying in 1980 and onward with his three C's. Um, if you think about the um, the input process and output in the middle as your business process. You look upstream for your suppliers and trying to figure out who is giving you your inputs in terms of all of those factors, material, um, your material suppliers, where your employees are coming from, who is your specialist, who's designing, maybe there's software involved, and what do you do with it? What are the, what are the uh, characteristics of quality materials and in the process? What do you what do you turn that into in terms of outputs and to what standard and how do you market that and then how do you interface with your customer? Uh, so as an analytical framework, as a, a value in motion, you know you might take uh, some kind of some template and figure out what is what is it that um, 
where does your value add come from? I would argue that if, even if you could use something like this for your uh, your five-year business plan, if you, if you were going to say, hey, let me, uh, let me think about being a consultant or providing uh, strategic advice or being a uh, process consultant where I help people develop their own ideas in a structured, systematic way that is robust that isn't just what their first thought, but actually uses the accumulated wisdom of management theorists over the last couple decades and uh, pressure tests or stress tests their ideas to really uh, learn in the laboratory how good those ideas are before you release them into the world. That's one of the most important things that your scholarly approach can do is that you're familiar with uh, the different ways in which ideas can be tested, what the boundaries are, and, and help guys discover that in the in the uh, R and D shop before they commit, you know, their real resources to it. So I just offer this SIPOC model as a way that you can proceed with developing uh, your business analysis case or developing your end state strategy. You could be designing an ideal situation or you could be taking a look at a new marketplace where you have a, you have a, you have envisioned an end state and you're trying to work backwards toward, well, what kind of products could I offer those that new and unserved market? And then what kind of processes would I have to have to create those outputs? And therefore what kind of inputs do I need in order to make the output, and then who in the world can supply me those things as inputs, and then starting to take a look at these interfaces between each stage of going for raw materials to final product and delivery. Uh, so that SIPOC model is a way that you can operationalize the connection between uh, the present day opportunity and the uh, successful end state in the future that um, that's going to drive our strategy. This, this is the implementing uh, analysis, the analysis of the implementation process, if you will. So I offer this as a, uh, as a tool set for you. So, um, I didn't see it in Valley Canvas, but it's one that has uh, uh, stood the test of time in a lot of different uh, disciplines. And this is a nice way to get started with understanding your environment and your opportunities. So um, <clears throat> let me uh, shift gears a little bit here. And I, I think Robert, I was going to talk a little bit about um, educational philosophy and teaching philosophy. So um, let me start with this one. So uh, the teaching philosophy that uh, I've had to develop at the at the uh, command and general staff college, uh, right here in the middle, is that a teaching philosophy, in my view, should uh, should begin with the purpose of teaching. That I'm teaching for what end in mind? You know, what what are the uh, the ultimate successes? Why do I why am I teaching? And what's the environment like? Who am I teaching? And what are the skills that they have to master? And that um, where are they starting from? Where do they have to get to? How much time do I have? And so that teaching philosophy uh, as a way to package all of that into some overarching principles. After I've mucked around down there in the mud and you know, done some of that analysis, the philosophy is sort of what I come back to that provides that overarching vision. And so this was uh, this was uh, something I put together around 2011-ish uh, to try to help the Army and my department understand what the role of our military college was, and with the Command and General Staff College. Um, we're teaching majors in the midpoint of their 20-year career. They've had 10 years of direct action leadership. 
in the field army at the tactical level where they've been uh, solving problems on a daily basis that are immediate and apparent and right in front of them. And it takes a lot of battle drill and training uh, to overcome tr uh, standard repetitive challenges, you know, in survival and victory and tactical engagements are not anything that's new and mysterious. Oh, well, I guess it's mysterious. But um, it's really much more about training battle drill. You know, that it takes certain, uh, a certain type of uh, training and teaching philosophy is appropriate for those kinds of officers. And that is I may be less concerned with the deep educational principles about an uncertain world, and I might emphasize different techniques uh, that are more directive in nature and repetitive in order to train a high degree of proficiency in standard tasks in order to lead to successful battlefield environments. So my teaching philosophy might still be uh, learn as much as we can, as fast as we can about the most important things and guarantee soldier performance. And if I have to accept risk, maybe it's in the understanding uh, at a deeper level in their cognitive mind, but I'm, I'm trying to train things um, to be automatic and instinctive and battle drill. And so my teaching philosophy might be different in that kind of environment. So that's what we teach them in the first two or three or four years in order to obviously survive and thrive in the immediate battle. When they come to us in the Command and General Staff College, though, they're 10 years older. Um, they have a lot of experience, and the challenges that they have in the future are quite a bit different uh, than the ones that they have just successfully navigated for the last 10 years. And so uh, we no longer can simply train them on certain tasks and think that's good enough. We actually have to educate them on principles that we think are timely so that they'll be prepared to find their own solutions in the moment when they're confronted with a new challenge, that they have some foundational principles to call upon uh, in order to find creative and, and uh, creative solutions that are that can survive contact with the real world. So they've got to be able to be creative, but at the same time critical of their own ideas. So to that end, we have this tension at the Command and General Staff College about the uh, about two different domains of knowledge. One of them is the world of doctrine, and the other is the world of informal practice. Informal practices are what they grew up learning. They're 10 years of experience based on customs and tradition and experience, the word of mouth and how they did it in their unit, one unit among many. Uh, and it may even be things that they've written about and talked about, but they have evolved and socialized this set of standard practices that have come out of their uh, experience and their local environment. They maybe even wrote about it and published it in journals, military journals, or in uh, exchange those ideas in their officer professional development program. At the other end of the uh, spectrum, we have this world of doctrine, which has been the distilled best practices from this world of application and has been studied and synthesized and theorized and uh, staffed around the world and reconciled with previous theory. And then it becomes, from the top down, authoritative guidance that has been approved by senior leaders and which has been directed and mandated to be taught in, in Army schools. And so there we are in the world of Command and General Staff College with a foot firmly in both of those camps that we're explicitly given the mission to teach the world of doctrine. But at the same time, we know that the doctrine of the future is going to come out of the best practices of what these guys in the field have learned works. And we have to help them find ways to discover the best ideas that after another period of social socialization will end up becoming the doctrine of the future. So in our view, or in my view, uh, a teaching philosophy must somehow address this uh, dynamic trade-off between the demands of doctrine 
and the demands of our learned best practices from our experience. We want guys to think about and reflect on and trust their judgment and their experiences. At the same time, we're trying to teach respect for the world outside of their experience. Now, how do we find the right balance point here in the Command and General Staff College? But if I have, in one academic year, I have 600 hours of contact time to talk with these officers, how do we blend this, these two competing sources of knowledge? Now, the hidden so what of this is that uh, it's what the graduates are able to do when they leave in the world that they discover once they graduate is where the real test of the proper trade-off occurs, that we can spend all the time we want talking about should it be doctrine or practice or should it be a combination, should it be 80% doctrine and 20% practice? Should it be 20% doctrine and 80% practice? All of those are professional judgments that we're going to make. And the act of making that judgment is to accept risk about the future and to suggest that whatever we decide is the right mix is going to be what is best for them going forward. And that requires us to have a theory of the future, a theory of what ought to work in the world, and so we find ourselves uh, struggling with that all the time. Not only making that decision in a uh, theoretical way from the top down, but then learning how to develop curriculum, how to write lesson plans that a 300-person faculty can reliably teach to 1,500 officers. So it's not enough just to come up with a design of this best trade-off between doctrine and practice but it demands that we find a way to implement it in such a way that our faculty can deliver it with reliability and actually produce officers that reflect, that have internalized the teaching that comes from our uh, discussion of what should be taught. So there's the world of what should be taught, and then there's the world of what is taught, and then there's the world of how well did we teach it and how well does it survive contact with that world of VUCA that's just out there waiting for us to eat us up. And so some of the things that we have to teach are not specific content material, but we have to actually teach them how to sense and respond and decide and develop on their own when they're outside of the, they don't have, when they don't have the faculty to rely on. We need these guys to become uh, self-motivated, self-actualized students of their profession so that they can learn as they go and incorporate some of these considerations in the way they comport themselves. Well, if that's my view of the challenges we have in, uh, in our teaching, that really is talking about the uh, operational environment and then my if I were then to put my uh, my philosophy, my teaching philosophy on top of that, my big P philosophy, um, if you will, somehow has to say, now as a teacher, as a leader, as a curriculum writer, as a lesson developer, what are some of those principles that I'm going to use to guide me as I as I engage in this trade-off decision between doctrine and informal practice as a member of the curriculum committee, as an author who can write on these different, uh, these different documents that range from the world of authoritative doctrinal publications and the world of professional military discussion and written form these journals, and all of these degrees of, uh, it, it gets increasing formality as you go to the left and more increasing creativity and critical thinking as you go to the right. Uh, what, what is going to be the philosophy and the principles that guide how I'm going to participate in the entire teaching process? A teaching philosophy, is that only governing how I behave inside the classroom with my students? Or does it also include the discussions that I should have 
with my peer instructors and with my supervisors who are making some of these big trade-off decisions. Is my teaching philosophy incorporating some of those ideas, or is it strictly how I'm going to behave once I cross the threshold into the classroom? Where is the classroom in my teaching philosophy? Where is the learning? Am I a teacher or am I a student of all of this? If I consider myself to be a learning scholar all the time, then I myself have to incorporate my own learning into my own teaching practice. And it may be that my teaching philosophy should discuss my role as a model student in the classroom. And in fact, that's the approach that I try to take all the time, and that is that when I walk into the classroom to teach them, what I'm really teaching them how to do is how to be a good student of the profession, to show them what it is that I'm learning and working on and reading and writing and thinking and testing. And if I show them that behavior and how to be uh, a critical and creative thinker uh, and then turn that into education about the profession, then I'm actually teaching them by modeling the learning behavior as a as what I think is a good student. And then I invite them to participate in assessing my own performance so that they can take ownership of what it is that I'm working on and what I'm teaching. Well, you take all of those things into account, and the way you think about writing your teaching philosophy will be very different than if you simply took a look at this as an industrial age operation where um, you're your teaching begins when you cross the door, the door frame into the classroom, and then the bell rings, and then you start lecturing, and then you test their ability to receive and process and internalize the messages that you sent against some objective standard. Well, a teaching philosophy in that model would be very different than uh, the teaching philosophy that you would write if you're in this uh, living, breathing classroom in part, which is a subset in a living, breathing world that's going on all the time around you. Uh, so what I would invite you to do then, Robert, is to think about uh, what it is that you're teaching and where and how and who and what and your purpose and your mission and, your, and the different roles that you undertake. And then your, your capstone philosophy might simply be a statement of principles and values and how you propose to act as just one cognitive agent inside that very dynamic and complex environment in and around the classroom, around your department, around the school, and in the world. I don't see those as, uh, uh, as barriers or isolation chambers. I really see those as part of a living, breathing organism with consciousness that's trying to adapt and improvise all the time. And so the teaching philosophy to me is the learning philosophy, it's the student philosophy, it's the communication philosophy, it's the, uh, uh, it's all of that. So that's, that's what I would, uh, I would offer you to think about in terms of um, a systems thinking approach to the development of a teaching philosophy. So as a result of that, you know, it's a lot of words on a page, um, what it, the, the next step in this was sort of a, uh, a hierarchy of uh, an approach to teaching them certain skills. And I wanted them to adopt some of these principles of good scholarship and, and, uh, and learning. But uh, I, I put it inside this context, um, which was that um, in the first place, I was there to, uh, to teach them the principles of sustainment, the F, and that was just one of the war fighting functions that they had to master in order to be a competent officer. They had to learn about the world of mission command, about intelligence and fires and maneuver and protection. Those are all components uh, taken together that leads to uh, what we think of as combat power or capability for the commander. Um, all of those things taken together uh, are what create capable units that are able to accomplish missions. And so my direct responsibility was in the world of sustainment, but I also had to show how sustainment connected to all of these other 
work writing functions. And to that end, we started off with a baseline of uh, the doctrinal terms of art that they had to master, some of the tools that they would use in their profession, and then how to find and confirm the basic facts and assumptions about the environment that they were working in and the units they were trying to support. And then we would proceed to the next higher level of complexity, looking at the kinds of missions that they would have to perform and the units they'd have to support, how to generate the requirements for support, how do you figure out how much fuel those supported units are going to use. There's a, a process of determining requirements. And then there's a process to figure out uh, uh, all the sustainment organizations that are available and what they're capable of doing, and then how you match the requirements with the capabilities to ensure you have the right uh, people that you can perform the sustainment function. And then we say, well, how are they going to perform that function? So now, if the first level led us up into this second level of analysis, we then say, now, the how-to causes us to take a look at how do we organize these organizations conceptually on the battlefield in order to successfully perform functions, and then we can make an estimate of how well that overall plan is going to go, and then we can take that back to the world of formal sustainment planning, and then learn how to integrate that with these other warfighting functions and how to produce orders and in, uh, in in products that units could actually use to perform battlefield operations. And then we had to learn how to then say, what are the threats and the risks to the successful accomplishment of these missions? We start adding those things together. And now we're into the, now we've completed planning, and now we can see how can we rehearse so that we're better prepared, and then how do we control those operations? All of these things are increasing in complexity as you go up to scale, but this was sort of a building block approach to how to teach and what to teach and in what sequence in a way that built upon previous success. And so this was, in some ways, taking the, philo the philosophy and turning it into a calendar, an approach, a priority scheme, and then knowing how much I had to do in each one of these before I could proceed to the next one in order to quickly get up to the top level where we could actually have them writing orders. So um, this is less about philosophy and more about how to, an application. Maybe it's an applied philosophy, uh, but there's certainly some analysis in there as well. So that's how in one world, I, now what I can do is I can take those, those values and principles that come out of the philosophy. You know, I, I've written my teaching philosophy now, and now I can take those values and principles and then try to apply them every day in everything that I do as I'm going about the technical part of the teaching, which is how to do, um, how to teach those particular lessons to that group of students and finding the right mode to ensure that they can learn um, Quick, as quickly as possible, and then assessing them in such a way that we can have confidence that they've actually learned what it is that we propose to teach. So uh, part of your teaching philosophy has to incorporate the how to implement and then how to assess and what the purpose of the assessment is um, in, in the way that you conduct yourself. So that's everything I wanted to say tonight about um, uh, strategy making, the use of models, uh, introduction to Kenichi Omai, uh, exploring uh, some of that in an applied setting, uh, and then um, talking a little bit about uh, an educator's view of this stuff uh, in terms of uh, like maybe a business plan or thinking about consulting. If you were going to do consulting, your thought process might follow exactly these steps, only instead of doing that inside an organization, maybe you're acting as a guide to help others discover these things, or you're applying it to your own area of expertise to figure out how you're going to um, uh, become that good um, uh, consultant or a teacher. Okay? Uh, so that's everything I wanted to cover. I would just invite you to maybe take a look at this, this stuff over here. Um, we are working on how to conduct visualization. There's uh, five podcasts and visualizations we've been um, 
that we're, we're using those podcasts to help in the way that we teach to make the information more accessible even outside of the classroom. So I'll talk maybe some more about that um, uh, next week. Um, but I want to post those for you. I, I think what I'm doing, I'm going to put those in a uh, in the announcements. So if you feel like looking at examples of teaching podcasts for the flipped classroom, how we can work on the um, uh, preparation phase so that the time that we spend in the classroom is working on applied discussions rather than simply listening to lectures. This is sort of one of those approaches. Um, and I can talk more about that next week. So again, uh, before I wind up, I uh, just want to check in with you once more. Uh, any any questions, comments, uh, before we call it a night and get on with the rest of this beautiful weekend? Okay. So these are some of the, uh, I will tell you that this chat that we've had tonight is very much what I sound like when I'm talking with our senior military leaders. Those are guys that come in from field units and then for one or two years uh, are in leadership positions in our college, and they're trying to rapidly understand what it is that we do. And so one of the roles that the civilian faculty play is providing that long-term continuity to the ongoing operations that uh, provides connections to previous generations and how things were done and why and what can we learn from the past and how do we apply that going forward that maybe gives them some uh, operational depth or, or perspective or context. And so as a, uh, as a doctoral um, professor, if you will, or having that do, uh, I get a chance to talk about some of those things and uh, these are the kinds of things that terminal degree holders can offer uh, those operational commanders or the chief executive officers who have, you know, they're living in the world of daily decisions, but they need some of these maybe uh, deeper insights or context insights to place their situation in, in a larger context so that they're not, they don't feel so isolated and alone. Um, that's some of the things that people rely on the doctors to provide is some of that maybe deeper insight to wait a minute before we decide let's sit back and think about this a little bit and um, so I think that's what being a student of your profession is is you're you can go beyond just the immediacy of the moment and provide some deeper content so I would invite you to uh, Consider that as you think about your IP number five and make some decisions about what you might want to write about. You have, really guys, you have earned the uh, flexibility initiative to write about what you want to write about, something that will give you the maximum value add um, uh, to your own program. So you've earned that through the uh, due diligence throughout the course. So. I stand here as a resource for you and uh, looking forward to your questions. If you have any, just send them by email and uh, we'll get on with it. So take good care and have a safe uh, weekend and we will see you in the discussion boards and then next week's chat.